go. What's up, y'all? What's up? Let's go. It's called a little night streaming. Let's do a little night streaming. We're going to do a little night streaming tonight. How's everybody doing out there? Sorry, it took me forever to... I have to plug in my phone right there because it won't stay in. Because All right, let's go, y'all. We're doing a little night stream tonight. We are covering Don DeLeo's 1985 text, White Noise. This is the National Book Award winner. This is his breakout novel. <clears throat> and, uh, excuse me. Yeah, and it's been a while since I've seen y'all. How's everybody doing out there? My AJ voice is uh, in top form. That's my natural voice. And, uh, yeah, it's been crazy, y'all. It's been a crazy couple weeks. Hope everybody is doing all right. Yeah, I thought we'd do a little night streaming tonight because it was a full night. We had our homeboy, JD, over there doing a marathon 24-hour session. Then we had Cotizi, Church of the Eternal Logos, was about to stream, but um, he uh, put his off till tomorrow, um, probably out of consideration for the uh, homies because he's so such an awesome, sweet dude. And then we had... Um, we had our homegirl based mom, based homeschool mom, and Jamie talking about um, Brittany and a bunch of high IQ stuff. Listen, based mom, Rachel Wilson, is the best researcher. She is amazing. And Jamie is obviously adept at all this. Hope y'all can hear me. Um, yeah, again, my voice has been in and out. So good to see all the homies in here tonight. And yeah, all the night crawlers, all the night daddies out there, um, all the cold ass riders, all the. Basement breathalyzers, the Chad nerds, the bigots, the Cotellians, uh, everybody out there, the star seeds. Shouts out uh, before we get started to our homeboy, Jerry the Iceman, exposing powerful lies live streams, who is um, now an official uh, alpha le level e celeb 1000 sub um, uh, badass Iceman. He is amazing. And um, yes, if I'm sure everybody here, of course, is sub to our homeboy over there, but if you're not, go to Exposing Powerful Lies live streams because um, he killed it the other day with his uh, his own part two analysis of H.P. Lovecraft. He is the expert, and so shouts out to him. And also, of course, to our homeboy Nick, uh, the Green Feathers. Please sub to the Green Feathers, our homeboy Nick. And we got some big things in the works, y'all. We got some big things in the works for August. Man, I wish this month would just end. Dang, I don't know about y'all. All right, so I'm going to be positive. But um, we got some big, uh, big things in the works for September. And um, what we're doing tonight, of course, let's go ahead and get started. Cheers, everybody. Little late night GMO drinking here. Um, so, yeah, it's been about, it's been a couple weeks here since we did our um, Jethro uh, sponsored stream on No Country for Old Men, Cormac McCarthy's No Country for Old Men, which um, seems to have done really well. And I was really happy with that one. I thought we did a, a pretty good analysis. So tonight we're doing something a little different, um, sort of in the same vein because we're doing a contemporary novel. Um, and I've been talking about this book for a long time, for months, really, how I wanted to eventually get to this book. Um, again, it's Don DeLeo's White Noise. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you kind of an introduction um, to the book and talk to you about it because I'm sure... You know, of course, I've got the most amazing based um, high IQ audience here and friends, of course, and probably, you know, a lot of people have read the book. If you haven't read the book, that's okay. That's what I'm here for. But I think that um, my point, again, is, you know, this isn't book club. It's not, I'm not doing book reviews. Um, I'm going to analyze the book and go, I think, pretty deep with it and because it, it deserves to... Um, have a deep dive. This is an amazing book. I've read it, I think, four times now that I can count. Um, and I would say, you know, I don't usually like recommend books, but if I had to recommend, whenever anybody asks me for book recommendations, I kind of, you know, I don't like to do that because for me, for example, um, I've always found it kind of, you know, um, someone will do a great thing. They'll give you a book or they'll, you know, say, hey, read this book, I read it, or they'll, you know, they'll recommend a book. But the problem is that, you know, I've got my own specific list, long list, always, of course, and a big stack of books that I want to get through. And books are personal, you know, they're, they're, they're a really personal thing. Um, and 
it's especially for people who don't read, who don't like to read, it's uh, it can be a complex process of finding the book that's right for you. I think that like when you're young, it's in a way it's easier because you know, your, your interests are kind of wide open and it's like, oh, well, you know, for instance, if you're, if you're like a, you know, let's say you're, you know, a young, a young lad and, um, you know, people are always saying you should read, but you don't really read. Well, you know, the cure really is go on your own, you know, get a, get a, I don't know, Barnes and Noble card or something from someone and pick out your own book, right? You would go there and you would find a book on, for instance, like gangsters or, uh, one of my friends back in the 90s, you know, he never read, but someone gave him a gift card and he heard about um, that Bo Jackson had written an autobiography. So I remember he went and he searched that book out and he like he it's it was his favorite book. He learned everything about Bo Jackson. It was so cool because, you know, it talked about like L.A. and gangs and, you know, just cool stories. And so that was personal to him. Um, so. You know, I don't usually recommend books, but if I did have to recommend one modern, fairly recent novel, let's say a novel from the past, you know, 40 or 50 years, um, this is the book that I would go to. I would go immediately to this book. I, it's it's incredible. It's amazing. It's not for everybody, but it's it is. I love it because it is the language is so rich. I mean, it you could read it in. I don't know. You can read it in an afternoon, but this, this current reading took me a long time because I was really, um, careful with the language. And then, you know, when you're looking at it, um, for, let's say for a breakdown, for a deep dive, it's the thing is that you can get wrapped up in individual sentences and pair. You could spend two weeks on one paragraph of this book. Um, I'm it's, it's, it's that good. It's really, really amazing. It's so stylized and so complex. And um, it, it's so good, in fact, that probably uh, many critics, especially critics, critics who um, really don't understand it, would probably say that, oh, perhaps it's overrated. I think, I don't know if Jonathan Franzen said it was overrated, but I, honestly, I don't give a shit what Jonathan Franzen says. Um, I think it's important to listen to critics of these things, but... Only as long as they are analytical literary critics um, with a highly uh, complex and stylized um, worldview. For instance, I'm always talking about Harold Bloom, and of course we're going to uh, read some of Harold Bloom's criticism of the book, his analysis of the book, and some other people in this in this uh, critical analysis. And I've also, I mean, I did so much reading about the book this time um, that... Uh, you know, and I, I just had to come on and do the stream tonight because otherwise I would keep putting it off and keep reading more. So let's dive into Don DeLeo's 1985 book, White Noise. Um, first of all, who's Don DeLeo? You know, usually we don't really talk about the author because it's important to look at the speaker on the page. Um, this, the speaker in this book, the protagonist is a guy named Jack Gladney. Um, and he is a He's a professor of, let's say, um, Hotler, Hortler studies at a fictional college called uh, College on the Hill. Um, and really, the book is—it's interesting. It's—it is so—it's—it's it's so postmodern that it's almost a satire of postmodernism, and that'll sort of play into my thesis of the book um, because it really comes. Um, 1985 is sort of the height of the climax of the. Cold War, and Don DeLeo is really a stylized writer um, in the, he's, he's almost prophetic in terms of the uh, age or the next era, the post-postmodern era, which would be the war on Tur, and then the one that followed that, which would be the, of course, the uh, Great Reset, which we are in now. And what's interesting about this book is that, um, you know, when, when the uh, coup happened, when it first happened and the lockdowns happened, um, you know, t two years ago, I immediately thought of this book and I, but I didn't, I didn't go back to it and I didn't read it. I wanted my, my memory of the book to be its own thing. And this time I've gone back with a little bit of time perspective and it's amazing how, I don't know if prophetic is the word, but this, the book is about what happened in the last two years and it's about now. It's, it's really, it's, 
it's almost to an insane level. But the thing is that he's such an amazing writer and, and craftsman that it all makes sense in this sort of um, K or, or in a way it's like, um, if, if this makes sense, um, it's, it's oxymoronic, but an ordered chaos of static and advertising and big, big, big P H A R M A and um, intelligence, academia, the MIC, the book has, um, it has crisis actors. It has simulations. It has uh, fake FLAGS. It's got everything in it. And it's this um, weird, like, televised, painted, electronic landscape that you can't quite grasp. But his words are so, the, the diction in the book is chosen so perfectly. It's almost like, Okay, so this is, I know this is getting, it, this seems like it's getting off track, but I'll just say that when I hear about um, Milan Usk and the Neuralink, right, um, the perfect first book to be loaded, to be uploaded to the interface would really be this book. I mean, it's, it, is, it is so perfect. It's almost like a straight uh, transmission to your brain where you understand it, but it's hard to, it's hard to um, enunciate. It's hard to say really why it hits you so hard. And it's, so, okay, so here's what the plot is. Um, this is the narrative. Um, white Noise is about a, uh-oh, dog's barking. White Noise is about a family um, in a small college uh, suburbia and um, they are pretty disaffected with the, uh, you know, the, the world, the state of the world as it is, and they are completely ruled by sort of McLuhan-esque media. Um, hold on one second, you guys. Hold on. Okay, there we go. Dog, he was hungry. All right, forgive me for that, y'all. So um, anyway, he teaches at this place called College on the Hill, and he's a professor of the uh, of hot, let's say, Hotler studies, um, which is a department that he founded, which is obviously meant to be um, ironic, and it shows the sort of the the like upper level irony of the you know the ridiculous nature of certain courses at um, school, but. Um, that's going to play a part in the fear aspect of the book, which I'll get to. He's married. He's got a few kids. Um, his, he's a professor of, of course, Hotler studies, but he speaks no German. Um, his son, of course, is named Heinrich, which he chose as a specifically uh, Nordic strong sounding name, he says, to sort of go along with his uh, persona that he's cultivated at the college. Um, and he does this ironically, but it's, but it's funny. He has a, uh, a friend who's also a professor named uh, Murray J. Siskind, who is kind of like a Zen slash, uh, he's, he's like hyper aware of, of the state of the world and the zeitgeist and reality and pop culture. Um, but, he's, but he's also kind of a degenerate. Well, he is a degenerate, um, which sort of, it, it, that, the juxtaposition is between the sort of um, Jack Gladney, uh, protagonist, like not every man character, but a guy that we can relate to versus the uh, Siskind who is uh, sort of a, a foil, but plays an important role in the text. Um, he's, uh, of course, he has a couple of other kids. His youngest um, child is named Wilder and uh, the names are obviously um, uh, significant and symbolic in the book because Wilder is a young boy, um, very young, who um, I don't think he ever speaks but he absorbs all of the, the, the atmosphere and the tone of the book in a way, in like a, in a pure way that the other characters don't. And something happens in the very end of the book, which uh, involves him, which is uh, pretty significant um, and sort of tempers Gladney's worldview. Um, there's a, there are a number of other like characters who sort of float in and out and who are not caricatures or, or even archetypes, but, they, they're pretty rich characters, um, and they all have like this, you know, it's Gladney's way of looking at them and discussing them um, that gives it the book its sense of humor. It's a funny book. The book is, 
it's funny. It's not a it's not a it's not a comedy. It's a satire, but it's sort of a meta satire. It's interesting how it works. And again, it's another one of these books where like the layers sort of fold one on top of the other, and we get this. The meaning is like this. Um, there's a there's a spider web of meaning where all of the events connect. Um, and it's interesting, you know. Just a side note that we continuously are confronted with like intertextuality, right? Or, you know, synchro, man, right? This sort of Jungian um, synchro where events and things connect or whatever um, in text, especially this especially happens in books and text, at least for me, because what will happen, for instance, is I will, you know, read a page of a book and I will come across a word that, you know, that I, I notice and it's a, it's a word I haven't seen in a long time. For instance, um, one word in the, one of the criticisms of the book was the word uh, inchoate, right? And I haven't seen that word in a long time, but I guarantee that that word will, will reappear in something that I'm reading tomorrow or in a week. And that just happens because of language, right? But what it does in the book is it gives this sense of continuity and normality, which is, again, contrasted with the weird sort of future McLuhan, almost like alien to their society, um, consumer advertising language of the, the diction that is constantly repeated throughout the text. Like the words, are, there are a lot of X's and Z's in this book. Um, you know, there's like, there's a scene where um, Gladney walks into his daughter's uh, bedroom. He's checking on her at night when he's going to bed and she's dreaming and she's like, talking in her sleep and she's saying she's saying uh toyota celica toyota celica which is obviously is a satire on the fact you know on the fact that the the young are targeted with uh television advertising and it becomes like this mantra the second language to them that they speak even in their dreams um the adults aren't as susceptible to it but it, it's also meant to be a it's sort of an allusion to Tolkien, right? Um, Tolkien, uh, Tolkien, um, right? The uh, the cellar door. At least that was my interpretation, right? Cellar door, cellar door, the most beautiful phrase according to Tolkien in the English language. You, you know, hitting all of the the especially the vowel sounds. Toyota Celica. It's a beautiful phrase. If it didn't have the meaning that it does, I mean, it's interesting that in the eighties, especially, I I can almost guarantee that one reason. Toyota had such popularity like in the early 80s um, through the decade would be because Toyota has the word Yoda in it. It's got that has to be true. Right. Um, and that's sort of the opposite of how. Um, let's see. What, what was it? The Chevy. Remember the Chevy Nova? The Chevy Nova was a notorious flop. They tried to um, Chevrolet tried to export it to Mexico uh, to sort of gain in popularity like the VW Beetle did. Remember, there were like more Beetles, more uh, punch buggies in Mexico than any other car. But it never took on and they couldn't figure out why. And it's obviously because Nova in Spanish is no ba, right? No go. It doesn't go. You don't want a car that's named don't go or it doesn't work. Um, so, yes, David's got it. He knows that. He knows that one. That's probably pretty common. People probably know that. Um, but, yeah, um... What, what, what did it have on the sheets? I don't know Yodas and shit. You remember that? What's that from, y'all? Raised in Arizona. Cohen Brothers. Of course, we didn't choose to uh, analyze that one because it's uh, Nick Cage. That's JD territory, of course. Um, and we spent all our time on No Country for All Men. We got to go back to the Cohen Brothers, though, for a further analysis because there's, there's a lot in the Cohen Brothers. Um, and even though Burn After Reading is a, people kind of hate that movie, I think it's worthy of an analysis. So I just got to find something to in which to anchor it. Um, I, I think that John Malkovich in that movie is, he's obviously like, what is he, State Department um, intelligence? But he has a, he's a, he's like a literary figure. He's kind of like, a, uh, what's that guy's name? Uh, um, Jack Gladney is also supposed to be a take on, is it Gladwell? Who's the guy's name is based on? Anyway, um, he's sort of a, a, you know, a literati slash intelligence guy, kind of like the guy who, what's the name of the dude who published the Paris Review? Um, George, 
uh, somebody in the chat helped me out. The guy who published the Paris Review, he founded it. He was also uh, CIA connected. Anyway, that's important in this book because one of the um, sort of uh, sub-theme, like um, one of the sort of strands that overrides the narrative is the fact that Jack has been married three times and his, I think his second wife was a, worked for CIA. And in fact, um, her husband is out on some sort of, you know, a black bag mission. Um, and he is obviously supposed to be like a E. Howard Hunt character. In fact, Howard Hunt, the famous CIA guy, Watergate and all that, um, was also, did you know that he was also a published author? He, that's one of the ways that he um, funded himself when he was undergoing the uh, his um, you know, all the stuff with uh, Watergate. We covered that with the G. Gordon Liddy book. But I've actually got a copy of one of Howard Hunt's books that he wrote right here. It's called Cozumel. Look at this. And, of course, it's a thinly veiled um, book about his own time uh, as, um, I don't know if he was Mexico City chief, station chief, that might have been William F. Buckley, but anyway, moving on. Um, it's interesting because one of the people that uh, Gladney has to uh, confront, there, are, there is no real villain in the book. Um, in fact, the, the, the plot in the story is, is secondary to the overall general like malaise and fear and loathing and the atmosphere and the long sort of meditations on life that... That, that take up most of the narrative. Um, there's not there's not really a, a plot per se, and you you might hear that and go like, okay, well then what the fuck? Why am I going to read it? Well, because the fact that there is no plot is the the exact statement on the sort of meaninglessness of postmodern thought, right? Um, Jay was talking about this earlier today in his. Um, in his Q&A, talking about postmodernism and how, uh, you know, the, the sort of belief, like the sort of lack of belief and the sort of nothingness of postmodernism um, overtakes culture, but it doesn't hold. And it's interesting because, you know, in terms of literature, I would say that the modern era, right, is, of course, if we were going to enumerate it, would be 1901, right, the death of Queen Victoria, um, to... I guess mo many, you know, any anthology would probably say 1901 to the present. We're sort of still in the modern era. Um, if you were going to break it down further, you'd say it was 1901 to 1945. 1945 is, of course, the you know it's Hiroshima and Nagasaki. So we, the world complete, the landscape of the world changes. We go from, you know, individual and 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 mechanized warfare to thermonuclear war at the press of a button. Um, and so that sort of, that's a, a, a singular event that creates a split, um, in, well, in the century, um, certainly. And then we have, I, I would say, I'm sure other people say this too, but this would be my sort of thesis that postmodernism is 1945 or the contemporary era, as it was called in the nineties, 1945 to, uh, 2001, right. With the cold, the cold war. And then 2001, of course, we have the War on Terror, right? We have the Big Nine event, which is another big, you know, singular event that splits, that splits humankind and consciousness and the psyche and, you know, all this stuff creates a sort of new world. And then that's very brief. And then we have, of course, now the uh, great RESET. Um, and it's, again, it's interesting that this book is, a, is I don't know if it's so much prophetic of those things of the end of postmodernism and the sort of joke and then the uh the 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 simulation and the personalized warfare and the uh, bacteriological warfare and all that stuff um but i think delia was actually asked about this in one of the interviews and he said he wasn't prophetic he just saw it as the natural course of things however you got to be pretty dialed in um to see that as the natural course of things in 1985, I think. Um, and it's also interesting that he talks about the idea of conspiracy because um, DeLeo writes specifically about 
conspiracy and what it means in his book, Libra. Libra is about um, the media obsession with um, Oswald, right, uh, after the uh, big November event, and, um, and what that means in consciousness. And he says that, of course, of course to the boomers and, and before that, um, 1963, the big, the big event in 1963, was the big event that he says, um, or at least this writer says, uh, created a sense of paranoia down to the individual not just in society as a whole, but down to the individual. And I would say that that's not really correct because it's not paranoia, right? It's simply awareness of the fact that there are conspiracies and they are real. Um, yes, uh, let's see. Okay, here it is. This is in the New York Times 1985 article. Um, it says... Uh, I have an entire library shelf, including 26 volumes of the Warren Report, half of which I read thoroughly, fairly thoroughly when I was working on Libra. It consumed the culture. That's not an exaggeration. After 11 63 the big event, everybody began to think in terms of paranoia. Then it was gone, he says. Interesting, he says, then it was gone. Um, I brought this up a few times, how the, you know, the, the big uh, events, the life-changing, landscape-changing especially psychic, you know, splitting events um, seem to be here. And people like, you know, people like us are highly attuned to these things. Um, uh, and I say that over like other people, especially normies, because now two years, two, two years on, um, it's like, uh, what, what happened? No, people don't even, it's like nothing. It's like nothing ever happened. At least that's my interpretation of how they feel. I, I don't know. That's certainly the way that it looks. Um, the question is, you think the culture has not become more paranoid? And DeLeo says, we could say that there was a conspiratorial element in the current situation in the Karanka era, but I'm not sure how seriously the commentators and students of this era take it. Otherwise, I think that sense of conspiracy is less prevalent now than it used to be. That's an interesting thought. I almost thought that was kind of based. Because he, it seems on the surface, both crypt, cryptic and sort of anti-boomerite, um, where the past is prologue, right? Um, and again, it's not paranoia when it's actual conspiracy. But then again, he goes on um, to discuss the idea of uh, MASKS, and he doesn't really offer that much of an opinion on it, but, you know, I hate to imagine that... I hate, See, this is the thing. I hate to imagine that these people who write these texts... Um, go on to sort of like negate what they wrote in their significant work. And that's one reason why I, I shy away from, you know, asking or looking into the author's opinion about their work and just letting it speak for itself. I mean, a great example of this, I think, would be Doug Valentine, um, who's, you know, you can, you can say what you want about um, his Phoenix Program book, but I just think it's interesting that, you know, if you watch if you read his tweets or you, you know, check out interviews or anything recent with Doug Valentine, it's like, man, you wrote all of this, you know, revelatory stuff and you, you know, the Phoenix program and, and, you know, as a, as a practice for, for domestic uh, full spectrum dominance warfare. And then you go on to, you know, get obsessed with like the, the presidential elections and the, you know, bogged down with like the minutia of, you know, the bullshit. You know, I just wish that they would go all the way. And of course, that's, you know, I don't know. That's probably wishful thinking. And maybe it's not fair of me to offer that criticism. Maybe I'm reading too much into it. Um, but that's that's my take on it. Um, okay, so White Noise. Uh, again, the book was written in 1984. Um, it was published in 85. National Book Award winner. Um, DeLeo has never won. I don't know if he's ever won. a. P he might have won a Pulitzer Prize for... Um, for Underworld, his massive tome, Underworld. But this was certainly his breakout book. And I've read, um, of DeLeo's works, I've read White Noise, Libra, Mal 2, Running Dog, Cosmopolis, Point Omega, Great Jones Street, and The Body Artist. And the, the latter half of those are kind of more current and less exciting um, than, the, than the former. Um, and 
Mal 2 was a difficult book for me to get through. I read because I read it when I was like 19. I got on this sort of DeLeo kick because I first read the book because my AP English teacher um, recommended it when I was, I think, 17. Um, and I read it and was astounded. I was blown away by this book. I never, it was the most adult and like um, relevant, you know, highly like futuristic techno book that I'd, I'd never imagined there could be a book like this. It was totally out of, like out, out of this world for me. Out of this world. Shouts out to Jamie and based homeschool mom there, Rachel, for their awesome stream earlier. Um, but I read it again in when I got to my first year um, of college. And then I read it again when I went to, I went to Rome um, for Christmas in 2005. I read it again there. And then I read it again this time. Um, all totally irrelevant information for you guys. Sorry, just going down a little memory lane there. But what I'm trying to say is that, yes, I not only like the book and appreciate this book, but it is a, it is, to me, this is like what a novel, this is not only what a novel should be, but it's like everything that most prose is not. In other words, it, it's so far beyond not only anything that was happening then, but even that's happening now. That it, it's, it, it's almost impossible to imagine how someone could write a book like this. It's so amazing. Um, of course, it sort of fits into the mold of like Thomas Pynchon and other sort of postmodernist Gravity's Rainbow and all that. But it's not like that because Gravity's Rainbow gets... Get, is, is a heavy book that is sort of like way weigh, weighs on you with the events in the book and and it it, it doesn't have the it doesn't have the sort of uh, the, the continuity of this it doesn't have the humor for one um, or uh, like David Foster Wallace and I don't want to I'm not gonna you know speak uh, poorly on David Foster Wallace's work I guess and I know that there are a lot of fans of DFW out there I'm not a fan um, but this sort of this certainly fits into the time frame, um, and Infinite Jest, uh, and this and this work are certainly like they converge in a number of ways, like with the the emphasis on television and mass media and consumerism. But this one just does it in a completely different way. Um, so let's yeah, let's get I guess let's get into some of the passages in the book. Um, so what happens uh, basically in the plot? I discussed some of the plot, but what happens is um, the family sort of living their life, and all of a sudden um, there is uh, what's called a in the book it's called a, a toxic airborne event, which is essentially um, it's a it's a chemical spill through a uh, a rail car on a train, and it's amazing because this actually happened in India like not long after the book was published, like right down to the exactly what happens in the book. Now, of course, I um, think, you know, I cannot help but see parallels between everything dealing with Karanka and what happens in the book because of the simulation and the psyops and all that, which we'll get to. Um, but what happens is there's a toxic airborne event, which is essentially a black uh, chemical cloud that appears like a looming... Um, you know, dread. it's not like a mushroom cloud, but it's like this sort of all-encompassing, almost black goo-esque death cloud that appears over the town. And so then the, 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 the military comes in and they have um, drills and they essentially say like shelter in place and everybody sort of, people freak, some people freak out, but the Gladney family is like sort of, medicated by the anodyne of media and television and their their sort of malaise and worldview. And the only people who really get, like, the son, Heinrich, the teen son, he immediately gets it. He knows what it is. He identifies it. He says, uh, oh, we learned about this in history class. It's a, it's a chemical compound called, it's, uh, what's it called? It's called, um, it's got an awesome name, um, which is, it's made up. It's a made up name, I think. Um, it's called, it starts with an N, um, uh, niodine D it's called niodine D. 
and which sounds like a you know total death dread cloud, right? Um, and uh, and so you know they, they have to beware of the prevailing winds and all this stuff, and then they start to become aware of the fact that there there are like weird like medical things happening, you know, in terms of uh, symptoms. They're like there are miscarriages, birth defects. Some people get boils. Some people get. Uh, you know, M O N K E Y P O X. Other people, you know, they they come down with all these sort of weird um, ailments. But the question is, is this real? It, because the book is set in a postmodern hyper reality, where the the symbol becomes the larger, you know, the the microcosm becomes the macrocosm, the sim the symbol and the simulacra, um, and it's further confused because. This this like group of they're called uh, they're they're clothed in like um, they're called Milex suits M Y L E X which is again a lot of X's and Xerox and Z's and E long E's uh, vowel sounds in this because it's supposed to mimic the the auditory onslaught of the white noise itself. Do you get it? Um, and one thing that I found interesting was that. Uh, there's a there's a passage where he he ends a chapter with the word Panasonic, um, you know, which is of course sound, all encompassing sound, right? Which is like a kind of a white a visual, a synesthesia, a visual white noise, right? And then I learned that um, DeLeo originally uh, titled the the book Panasonic, but they couldn't get permission from the Panasonic Corporation because the book is of course a criticism of technology, mass media, um, and the sort of ionic terror that it causes in individuals in this town. Um, throughout this all, Gladney is like trying to like run this, uh, this like international conference on Hotler that he's having at the college. He's trying to keep up appearances. Um, and the whole time, the whole book is essentially like a meditation on the meaning of death. What is death? Especially death in the context of not only, like, it's not really 80s America, but it's really just America itself. This is probably, you know, we've, we've of course, we've covered uh, Gatsby, we've covered Moby Dick, we've covered a lot of, you know, uh, American works here. Uh, we covered Emerson, but this book is probably the most American book that I, I may, maybe that I've ever read. It, it, it really captures something that I wouldn't otherwise consider, which is, uh, first of all, I just mentioned, you know, past is prologue, right? So it's like postmodernism cuts off the, it sort of cuts off, like with the A-bomb, it, it like, there's this explosion that cuts off history. And now we're, we're, we're now and we're in the future. Um, except for with, with DeLeo, there are like, and with the Gladney character, there are ties with like loose thread ties to like Emersonian transcendentalism or at least the tradition of it because it's this constant like discussion about how to transcend death. And it's, it's not in a, it, it's funny because it's not in a transhumanist sense. Um, it's simply the, the confrontation with death itself. And what happens is they learn that um, the the niodine D cloud is broken up um, with uh, a dispersal of like um, electrolysis and ions and a chemical compound, and the chemical compound is this thing called dilar D Y L A R, and um, then they find out that there's a pill, and that the sort of big pharma slash government slash intelligence have been doing human experimentation trials on people in the town um, with this drug called Dilar. So Gladney sort of goes on this mission to find out what, what Dilar is because what happens is his daughter finds a bottle of Dilar taped to the underside of a radiator in the house, and the daughter says essentially that their mother, Babette, her name is Babette, <laughs> a lot of waspy sort of collegiate names in this, right? Babette. Uh, Babette's, uh, it, it turns out Babette's uh, addicted to Dilar, right? Kind of like, um, you know, Mother's Little Helper in the Rolling Stones song, like Valium, or like, I guess like Oxycontin in the in the sort of war on terror age. 
Um, she's addicted to Dilar. And so he does this research um, on what Dilar really is. And what it is, is it's a, um, it's a, it's a disc shaped, um, uh, ra- roundish tablet with a laser drilled, um, this thing on my hat. Sorry. Um, with a laser drilled hole right through the, me- the, the center of the pill, which is a, um, a chemical delivery system. So what happens is like you take the pill and nothing can like break down the pill until it hits your, um, your gastrointestinal tract. And then the acid in the pill will break down the pill, but only in a way that will, uh, time release the, 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 the drug, right? Which is, of course, I mean, people are probably watching going, yeah, that's, that's what time release is. It's normal. But it's interesting because the book's, you know, 1985, and uh, this is sort of, as far as I know, sort of ahead of its time in terms of technology. And what it's releasing, the drug that it's releasing, is actually a drug that is supposed to make the user um, lose the fear of death. So, and that's that's a, a strange sort of esoteric concept to get a hold of, especially in a book like this. But what it essentially means is um, that the people that are testing it on this village, the you know we know the people that are test that are doing the tests, um, are trying to determine um, how far they can go to control people in terms of making them live like either in a childlike state or like beasts, right? And what's interesting is that its side effects are similar to, like sort of similar to like Soma in Brave New World, but it's like Soma, fentanyl, because it's sort of, an, it, it opiates you, and um, Adreno, because of the visions that they have when they take it. And one of the, like, Funny things about it is that the more the user takes Dilar, the more they lose the concept of like figurative language. So for instance, like if you're on Dilar and Jack Gladney comes in the room and he says, um, he says like, uh, he says like uh, duck, right? Uh, then the person will like, they'll like look for like a, an actual duck. They'll like look for an animal duck. Um, if he says like heads up, then they will like lift up the, they'll like try to like lift up their head, but like in a literal sense. So it's total uh, like mind control manipulation. And the person that is the Dilar dealer in the book that he confronts has been having an affair with Babette, his wife. And the Dilar dealer's name is um, Mr. Gray, which again, intertextuality, we just covered uh, Mr. Gray in. And the gray man in, was it No Country for Old Men? And we talked about him in the new Ryan Gosling movie, right? The gray man. Um, we talked about him in the context of the Norm MacDonald, uh, Albert Fish joke, right? The, the gray man. The grain man? No, the gray man. Um, the guy who disappears, right? The, 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 the spy who is totally, you know, uh, invisible in a crowd. And that is who... Um, is dealing the dialogue and it, he is an intelligence agent and his real name is what's his real name in the book um he's got some dumbass name in the book i forget but when um gladney confronts him he goes to this like cheap little motel because that's where these people do these things these experiments and um he's sitting there like in in flops and a and budweiser shorts and like a like a wife beater and he's like just popping dialar pills and he's like totally in this like weird like otherworldly trance because he 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 is the symbol of the sort of result of the oppression of the like intelligence class on this town without a conscience. He's just like this empty shell. And so what um so the reason that okay so I'm skipping way ahead but the the reason that Gladney confronts him is because he he talks with his buddy uh Siskind who's the other professor and um, by the way, Siskind admires Jack Gladney because he went out on his own and he pioneered this um, this department of of Hotler studies at his college. And Siskind says, "I want to do something that's sort of, you know, as as important in culture 
as that, but different. So who, whom do you think he chooses as his, uh, as the subject of his new department? It would be the Department of Elvis Studies, of course. And what's interesting is that there, I love that DeLeo does this in the book because um, even before I read this book, I, I don't know, it's not anything to like, you know, brag about or what. I'm not bragging, folks, but um, what I always thought was that there was this weird uh, connection, like a, a weird sort of double between um, H-I-T-L-E-R and Elvis uh, because of like what they represent in terms of the culture and the sort of power structure of the 20th century. I'll sort of get to that as we go on. But um, DeLeo sort of brings all that out in the book. And Siskin starts this Department of Elvis Studies. And, um, and uh, anyway, they're, they're walking along, like, sort of uh, bent over, kind of like uh, Mr. Chips slash, you know. Um, one, one thing Siskin tells uh, Gladney to do is to change his name from Jack Gladney to, he, he says, add another initial to your middle name. So it's like three initials and then the last name. It'll, it'll lend you gravitas uh, in your studies. People will take you seriously. And also wear glasses. So Jack Gladney sort of wears these glasses um, that he doesn't need. Um, he doesn't grow a beard, I don't think, but he adds an initial to his name so he becomes J-A-K Gladney, which is obviously supposed to mimic, um, I think it's supposed to mimic, uh, what's his name, Hugh Trevor Roper, uh, which is just a double barrel name. Hugh Trevor Roper wrote uh, The Last Days of Hotler. You know, he's the sort of authority on Hitler in the bunker. Um, and... Who's the other guy? Uh, ATQ Stewart. Is that who it is? I think that's who it is. The other Hitlerian scholar. Anyway, um, and so they're walking along on campus, sort of crooked, you know, crook neck, bent over like sort of two mandarins, um, conscientious of their image in academia, which, of course, is satirical. And, um, and Siskin says to Gladney, like, what do you like? What do you want to do in life? Right. And Gladney's like, uh, well, I want to do something, you know, visceral. I need to do something important. Like, he, he doesn't have any sort of, he feels like he's empty. He has no importance. He has nothing to, like, contribute, right? Especially in light of the, their world-ending events that have, they've just gone through. And Siskin tells him, this is pretty interesting, he tells him uh, basically that the only thing that's going to allow him to feel a sense of power in the in this postmodern you know empty uh, void zone in which they live, is to kill someone. So he says, basically, he decides to kill the guy who has been you know having the affair with his wife, the Dylar dealer, um, uh, Gray, and he gives him a uh, Zoom Waltz pistol, and now he has this sense of it's the, then it becomes a meditation on the significance of, you know, being armed and all this stuff, um, especially ironically, even though he actually is armed. And, um, and then Gladney has this plan, and what he basically, he, he goes to confront him, and he, he shoots him. He, he does shoot the guy. And he plans on, you know, watching him die and feeling the, this weird sort of academically written, um, almost study-like behavior of watching the guy die. But something else happens, which is um, Gray shoots him in the wrist. And so then uh, Gladney is, he's also now in pain. And so then he decides to rescue the guy he just shot and he gets him out. They both live. Um, and then really nothing changes. That's it. And then the end of the book is um, he's at like his house and he sees his son Wilder, who is obviously this wild child who is completely in his, he represents like pure, pure ego, but pure, like he's unaffected by all of the things in the world and yet totally absorbs them. But he's like, he's in a state of innocence and he watches his son on like a big wheel go down the hill. Everybody's calling after him. Stop. He goes down the hill, goes around a corner and then essentially goes right across the highway. Um, and miraculously is unhurt, like with cars going all the way by. And then he goes like sort of down towards this lake and then a car pulls over and pulls him out where he's almost drowned. And, um, and that's sort of a, 
it's it's strange because it's this final this final shocking event in the book that overtakes really all of the other events and is really just you know it's like a two page um, uh, part of the book and it's it's much more significant in the life of this family, especially of Gladney, than any of the prior events, uh, because he, you you think he's going to realize, you know, with the sun going into the water and coming back out like it's a baptismal event, um, you think he's going to realize that uh, life has meaning and that there, instead of chaos, he lives in an ordered world, right? But instead, um, the book sort of just ends and he says, he says, um, let's see. There is a sense of wandering now, an aimless and haunted mood, sweet-tempered people taken to the edge. They scrutinize the small print on packages, wary of a second level of betrayal. The terminals are equipped with holographic scanners which decode the binary secret of every item infallibly they go to the grocery store the grocery store is their their sort of um zen uh heaven in their consumerist world full is full of order it's all order right this is the language of waves and radiation or how the dead speak to the living and this is where we wait together regardless of age our carts stocked with brightly colored goods a slowly moving line, satisfying, giving us time to glance at the tabloids in the racks. Everything we need that is not food or love is here in the tabloid racks. The tales of the supernatural and the extraterrestrial, the miracle vitamins, the cures for cancer, the remedies for obesity, the cults of the famous and the dead. And that's it. So he ends in this sublime, ironic um, transcendence Shouts out to Bloxky out there, my homeboy Bloxky. Shouts out to Bloxky and Nico and Base Homeschool Mom and Jeff and all the homies out there who are, we'll call it, it's called we do a little late streaming here. We're doing a little late night streaming, y'all. Um, and so it ends in this, in, in the supermarket. Now, what is the supermarket? I mean, the supermarket, it re, what does it represent in this book? Well, it, it seems obvious as a symbol of, of uh, postmodernism and consumerism, right? All of the normal, all of the normal, um, uh, ways in which we would deconstruct the supermarket. But what it brings to mind for me is, first of all, I think of the Clash song, right? Lost in the Supermarket, um, which is this sort of weird Clash song, right? It's like a, it's like a, it's almost like an idyllic, like pastoral song by the Clash who are usually, you know, much more abrasive, um, which I think speaks to the meaning of the supermarket itself, right? Also, we have Allen Ginsberg's, um, poem, uh, um, what is it, A Supermarket in California, right, where he, where he sees Uncle Walt, his uh, pervert uh, muse, Walt Whitman, in the, like, what is it, in the melons and the kumquats of the uh, California supermarket. And um, we also have uh, William Carlos Williams and imagism and the supermarket. But what's interesting is I was watching um, that movie, uh, The Hurt Locker, just randomly yesterday. And um, what is the penultimate scene? What is the, what is the penultimate um, location? Of course, it is a supermarket, right? Jeremy Renner goes home from the chaos of war. He goes home. Now he's got this domestic life. And he, he sort of, the supermarket is the moment where he looks and he sees that all the order is, it's not him. He's got to go back to the chaos of war and destruction because it's all provided for him. All right, dogs barking. Let's take a break, y'all. I'll be right back, okay? Give me a minute.
Yo, what's up? We back. Oh, what's up? Hey, what's up, Tamara? How you doing? Listen, big shouts out. Big time shouts out. Oh, hold on. Sorry. Dang. Got a cut on my finger, y'all. That is annoying. Shouts out. Big time shouts out. Big time to our homegirl, um, our good friend, uh, our longtime OG, um, JD Chad Nerd Mod, uh, that I met a long time ago in the uh, JD house. Tamara. Shouts out to Tamara at Tamara Hathaway, Philippians 4 3. You guys, go to her channel. She's got an awesome channel. She makes really amazing and beautiful videos. And, um, we love you. I love you. Thank you so much for supporting me the other day. I really appreciate you. Um, I appreciate your love, support, kind words. You have always been amazing, and um, you are a good friend. Shouts out to, shouts out to our homeboy Jethro, um, who always, of course, our homeboy Jethro always speaks highly of all of our friends and chat nerds, but especially of Tamara. We love you so much. Thank you so much for supporting me. I really appreciate it. Um, and thank you for swinging by here. And again, everybody go to uh, Tamara, Tamara Hathaway at Philippians 4.3. Her channel is great, and she makes amazing videos. Um, shouts out to also to our homeboy Jack out there, who is always uh, supporting me and is a, um, a based uh, member of this uh, basement breathalyzer uh, little, little night streaming community we got here, y'all. Shouts out to Based Homeschool Mom, uh, ADH, Mixky, who is always supports me and is a great friend. Shouts, uh, shouts out to Blocksky, Block Party Vintage. Follow him on um, Instagram. He is the poster. Shouts out to um, Kim, Ellie. Shouts out to Real Cooter Brown, Matsky. Shouts out to Jerry at Exposing Powerful Lies live streams. Uh, Tristan at Primal Edge Health. Koteezy, Kotel, David Patrick Harry at Church of the Eternal Logos. Jamie Hanshaw at uh, Out of This World. Uh, shouts out to uh, AJ. Shouts out to AJ out there. Pray for you, um, Kang, Ewok. And shouts out to JD, J Dyer at Jay's Analysis, our good friend and buddy over there who has um, shared uh, our streams and who has um, supported us big time. We appreciate you and thank you. Um, thank you all for being with me here tonight and thank you for letting me take that little break, y'all. I figure we can do that because it's, we're doing a little uh, night streaming tonight, covering this high IQ deep dive work, um, Don DeLeo's White Noise, and uh, had to um, give the baby some water in there, a little doggy. You can hear her barking, because it's late night. And of course, we are late night tonight because we had um, the JD uh, Marathon stream in his Q&A, and then we had Jamie and Based Homeschool Mom. And then, of course, check out uh, TGF The Green Feathers, and check out uh, Emily, uh, TGF Emily, and their painting streams. And, of course, Church of the Eternal Logos, DPH, uh, live tomorrow at 1, Saturday. And also, always, always shouts out to uh, Kristen, our homegirl Kristen at Slow Boy Whiteboard, who is so amazing and so based, and we love you. You are amazing and awesome. Okay, let's see. Um, so, where were we? We were talking about, what were we talking about? All kinds of stuff, y'all. I'm all over the place with this book. So, why don't I um, give you some insight, um, some excerpts into the book here. Can y'all hear me all right? I'm, I know I'm, I keep like kind of mumbling away from the, from the computer mic over here. So, if I get too quiet, please just let me know and I'll speak up a little bit so all the affiliates can hear me out there. I mean, the thing about this book is that it's it's like verse. It's like um, it's like a prose poem in a way because uh, DeLeo is is a wordsmith. I mean, he's a he is a he is a writer. If anyone is an American writer, it is Don DeLeo. And who gives a shit about Nobel prizes and all the globalism and all that stuff? But look, man, if you're going to give a Nobel prize to a writer especially a prose writer, a novelist, give it to this guy, man. He's 83 years old or something. I mean, of course, maybe he doesn't want it. And maybe it would be ironic giving it um, to him because the book is also about um, 
globalism um, and it's it's sort of um, globalism and how it sort of makes an incursion into the life of the individual uh, down to the suburban level, which I see as one of the insidious things that has happened over the <clears throat> end of the war on terror into the uh, Great Reset era. That's one of the points, right? Is that these sort of um, these sort of uh events, the big events, you know, like with uh, with the big with the big November 1963 event, the big Dallas event, that's um, a huge event. It's one of the cornerstones of like the things that happen in all this, right? You get the big nine event, you get the big, the big Dallas event. Um, you get the, uh, I don't know what the, the, the Gulf of Tonkin, you get whatever the other ones are, right? Uh, Jekyll Island. I don't know. Um, but, the thing about those is that they they were massive and they were sort of uh, they were national and yes they did serve to um, put the common person or at least the populace through this sort of weird uh, blood R I T U A L right this sort of tra you know trauma ritual where you see this happen to the guy. Um, of course, it wasn't live. It wasn't live TV. And most people have a misconception of that, by the way. Most people think that the, for instance, the Zapruder film, they think that that was like live on TV and that was always there. But um, but it wasn't. Remember, the, the, the Zapruder film was locked up for a long time. Um, people did not see it. And it was actually, I don't know if it was first televised, but it was certainly televised and then kept um, in the television sphere for years after, beginning with, it was like in the 70s when they reopened the case. And what's the name of that um, that comedian, that S, that Saturday Night Live guy, um, who like showed, he, he showed it like on his show. So really, it's really weird. It's not like, you know, it wasn't like, a, I don't know, Cronkite or somebody showing it on the news. It was, And it wasn't like, you know, Mike Wallace it was that SNL guy um, who showed it, which adds just so many other layers of weirdness and, you know, uh, you know, just question. There's so much with that um, that that's 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 for someone else to do. That's but but it plays a role in the narrative of this book and in the sort of consciousness of DeLeo in general, because it is the event that sort of um, all, all the other things both are, they're both uh, glued to it and they emanate from it. Um, and like he was just saying, that idea of, you know, paranoia and conspiracy. Um, of course, now we live in an era where the things that happen, you know, at the top of the pyramid, um, the global events, affect the individual everywhere in, in cities, in suburbs, uh, in the countryside, all of those things. I mean, you know, of course that happened with the big nine event, right? Um, remember Richard Reed? Most people probably don't even remember his name, but Richard Reed was the, uh, shoe B O M B E R. If I'm not mistaken, if, if he wasn't a different one, but he, he wasn't the underwear guy, was he B O M B E R. I think he was the shoe guy. Remember how that stupid fucking thing, that one damn shoe event? And I remember at the time, and of course at the time I was, you know, I was totally all in on the on the WAR and all that stuff. I've told you that before. I was all in on that. Uh, some of that comes from where I was when the Big Nine event happened. I was abroad. I wasn't in this country. Um, so I was separated from, from the event in a number of ways. I had flown that route the directly the week before. Um, not that that makes a difference, but, but, um, you know, and I, I've mentioned how, like when it happened, I, nobody knew what was going on. I couldn't get through. The phone lines were tied up for like four days. Couldn't talk to my family. Didn't know if they were alive. My first thought was who, who did this? Was this the fucking Russians? I thought that was over. Nobody, you know, in, in terms of like regular people had heard of, uh, B I N L A D E N. 
if I'd been listening to AJ, of course, I would have known about it. Um, but anyway, um, when that happened, and then when the shoe thing happened, even I was like, this, this is this is going to affect us forever. We're going to take our shoes off and we're never going to, we're never just going to walk right through. It's going to, this changes everything. And it did. And we all know that, you know, the security state and the apparatus and all that stuff and making the airports, the front line in the, you know, physical assault psyop war, right? Um, airports and, uh, S C H O O L S is my, my, uh, own, my own theorem, I guess. But, um, but yeah, I mean, the, what's weird in this book is that this huge toxic airborne event happens and everyone is affected by it. And they have these guys in Milex suits, which is a take on Mylar, obviously. They're basically biohazard suits. They're masked up. And um, the public sort of just mills about. They have no conception of like, whether this is important or not. They don't know if it's real or a simulation. And then what happens is the Simuvac teams come in, S-I-M-U-V-A-C. They have Simuvac, you know, on their Milex suits come in and they start essentially casting for um, crisis actors for a simulation for an event that just happened. And their reason is they say, well, we learned a lot from the event and we need to practice for the next event so we can do things differently. Now, that's interesting because, first of all, it mirrors the response to Karanka and what still happens now. Listen to the spokespeople talk about it, right? Um, which is just another... I mean, people will watch that and they'll go, oh, no, no, that's, you got to listen to the, uh, to the uh, you know, Dr. Flossie because he's right. You know, this happened and... We got to get ready for the next one because, you know, you know it'll happen. When at the same time, uh, people with any sort of, you know, um, critical thinking or, you know, any of that are like, well, we just went through it. Why do we need a simulation? Didn't they have enough data from the thing that happened if it happened? And when they're saying it's going to happen, does that mean they're planning on it happen happening? The Karanka part two? Well, of course, right? Um, and the whole thing was a uh, psy op in the first place, and I'm not saying that like the whole thing, but as Norm Macdonald would say, the whole thing. <laughs> um, and that's what happens in the book. In fact, Gladney uh, is walking through this, you know, sort of uh, pile of um, fake uh, bodies because they're simulating the event. And he sees his, like, 11-year-old daughter there. And he's like, what are you doing? And she's like, I'm dead. You got to go away. Um, and he's like, w why are you doing this? And the response is essentially like, well, because, like, we're just doing it. There's no real reason. But she's like, oh, it's the, it's the right thing to do. Now, the question, of course, becomes, what does right mean? Right? What is, what is right versus wrong in this situation? Why do they believe in a right versus wrong when... Their entire lives are focused on empirical data and observation. And then when it comes time to actually physically observe the observable thing, they're just uh, totally uh, overwhelmed and overtaken, partly because they've also subjected themselves to experimentation with this Dylar shit. And the, the crazy thing in the book is like, there's no like reason for them doing this stuff. There's no reason for them acting the way that they do other than that they live in a postmodern sunset where there really are nukes and radiation are like those things were like on the horizon and they still sort of are and they are like they could happen but they're disconnected from that because it's too big an event of an event. And the next phase is like this sort of bacteriological electronic, you know, harp storm. And when that happens, is the simulation a simulation? Does the simulation go live? Um, were they, was the actual event a precursor for a simulation? Was it a precursor for another real event? Um, was that a real event? And then it's going to create another real event. It, nobody knows and they don't even ask. Some people ask or they sort of ask about it. Um, but in a way, their loathing and their sort of dread and terror, this sort of Ameri 
very American terror that is unique to America that really no other place can have like a visceral re relationship to. They only sort of see it from a, a, a third, from a, a, an objective sort of away standpoint. Kind of like Americans and war, right? How the war happens, but it's always over there. That's why at the end, again, at the end of The Hurt Locker, uh, Jeremy Renner, who is this weird sort of, by the way, in that movie, he's this weird sort of like ghost-like um, character who I guess he's, I guess he embodies the, the, like the uber stoic in a way. I don't know how to describe him. He just seems unaffected by events. Um, he never talks or mentions anything about how, you know, it's just fate. He never does that. He just is. He just exists. Um, and then his tour is over and then he goes home and he's in the supermarket and he looks and there's like endless, you know, rows and shelves of cereal. And he sees his wife and he's like, what do we get next? And she, she has this sort of uh, derisive, like, you know, scowl. Um, and she's like, go get the whatever, go get the milk or whatever. And he's like, okay. But looking for the milk and the cereal is like an impossible task, which is ironic because he's a bomb guy and he can find bombs in like piles of rubble and dirt because it's meaningful, because it affects him. And then he goes home and it's just endless purchasing, right? It's just endless labels and they're all multicolored and they're neon and there's like, you can hear the buzz of the lights. This, again, this sort of white noise, this sort of phosphorescent death that hovers over them. Um, and the look in his eyes is one of just, um, it's like, I don't know, homesickness and, uh, and yet like, purpose. He, he knows his purpose is to go back and do what he was doing before and spend another year, another 365 days in his rotation um, looking for bombs, right? And in this book, um, they are so bombarded by the, uh, the overarching consumer overlord like ambiance that just totally surrounds them that again, they not only like repeat phrases and, and ditties and songs from ads, uh, but they also like, they live by them as if it's a religion and they dream about them and they find comfort in that. Um, but their comfort leads to loathing and unease. Um, and then they sort of, some of them realize that they have no meaning in their life. But other characters like Heinrich, at first you think that the teenage son is kind of based because he, he immediately understands the, the toxic cloud. He understands um, silver cadmium. He understands the ionosphere. He could probably talk about the heart machines if he wanted. Um, and he is adept at talking about uh, natural disasters, uh, man-made disasters, plane crashes. Um, oh, one thing is... Uh, one thing about Heinrich that's interesting is what it, the main thing he does for fun, um, his main hobby is chess, which is, you know, the, the symbolism is obvious within the text. However, his chess partner, his chess partner is absent because he uh, plays chess through the mail with his pen pal, and his pen pal is a convicted uh, murderer, mass murderer, serial killer. And Jack, the dad, is like, um, so do you have to play chess with this, this guy? And Heinrich's like, well, yeah, he's my chess partner, what, you know? And it's, it's funny because it's like, it's edgy and it's like very, you know, uh, you know, teen, teenage angstish. Um, but at the same time, it, it also shows you one of the themes in the book, which is that, you know, again, it's this like, postmodern inversion where the kids have all the power and they're right and they are smarter than the parents and the parents like don't really care they sort of like lose in this weird non-power struggle and they don't they don't really give a shit um and so Heinrich goes from being sort of based to being the ultimate consumer because 
he doesn't believe there's any meaning, he doesn't believe there's any purpose, and he doesn't believe in truth. Uh, in fact, he in one passage he talks about, what do you mean by truth? Truth is subjective. My truth is different from your truth, which sounds incredibly relevant in the time we in which we find ourselves. Um, and I'm not saying that he's right. I'm saying that that's a thing that people say now in terms of uh, in the world, right? Shouts out to Ellie, who's awake now. Let's see, it's two. Well, I'm counting on my fingers in front of you guys because I can't count good. And I've been pretending to read all this time, you guys. I've been like, I've been looking at this book right here and it's real good. Um, you know, somebody told me it was real good. I pretended to read. Um, and that's why I count on my fingers too. You know what? Who gives a shit? Count on your fingers. What's wrong with counting on your fingers? I guess it looks pretty weird as a grown man in public. But listen, good morning to Ellie in uh, beautiful in the beautiful Mediterranean right now, and I hope you're having a wonderful day. And we did this as a night crawler late stream um, just so you would get up with the sunshine and you could join us. And seriously, though, we, uh, we pray for you and we love you and uh, we love all of our homies out there. Um, okay, so I'm just going to read you a couple things from the book here. I know I'm babbling on, y'all. But um, listen, if you want to support the stream, by the way, I know it's late night. I know it's late for people to be uh, clicking them buttons and sending them uh, Dugan coins and um, Gipper coins, right? Uh, Fed coins or whatever. But if you want to support me, I sure would appreciate it. Please uh, look at the links in the video description. Hit that little down button. Um, in the channel description, and that my homies have been dropping in the chat throughout, right? Venmo, PayPal, Cash App. Please support me. And if you do it, of course, if you do it, Cash App, um, and I think Venmo, you can leave me a little message, and I'll read you a little shout-out. Maybe I'll do a cringe impression or sing a, sing a song badly for you. Um, <laughs> I didn't really sell, sell that very well right there, but thank you. Um, okay, so... Yeah, so a couple of things I wrote down here. One was um, on page 291, the idea of kill to live. So again, uh, Murray, Gladney's friend, says to him essentially that, look, if you want to have power in this you know, chaotic world, um, the only thing that you can do, he says, we're a couple of academics taking a walk, but imagine the, the uh, visceral jolt, seeing your opponent bleeding in the dust. You think it adds to a person's store of credit like a bank transaction? Nothingness is staring you in the face. Utter and permanent oblivion. You will cease to be. To be, Jack. The dyer accepts this and dies. The killer, in theory, attempts to defeat his own death by killing others. He buys time. He buys life. Watch others squirm. See the blood trickle in the dust. Now, this is really dark because these characters have been comedic and satirical. But what we get here is actually the end result of this sort of postmodern idea of freedom and liberty. And of course, um, nihilism and meaninglessness leading to oblivion. And the oblivion is, you know, is the never having existed in the first place. Like if you wish your soul could just turn to a sort of a ionic dust with the toxic airborne event and just dissipate and in a sense that's what Gladney wants but what he what he learns from Murray is that instead he can live um, or at least his concept of a soul can live by dominating another person's life which is obviously a this is this is evil but it's it's more than that it's it's like this DeLeo writes this because this is like the American archetypal idea of, this is like serial killer phenomenon brought to literature because this is exactly what, remember Son of Sam um, said this in his like most recent interview and his most recent confessions. Um, JD did a whole stream about that where he said that um, I think of the eight murders of which he was convicted like he committed um no more than i think six of them it, admit, at least two of them he said no i didn't really i admitted to it but i didn't do it and when they asked him about it he said uh 
listen, man, the whole thing with the dog was people, they didn't get that. He said he was in a cult. He was a servant of Satan and the, a demon spoke through the dog and the demon was Samhain, right? Spelled Samhain. That's why they say son of Sam. And it wasn't like the dog, right? He wasn't like, he was insane, but not insane in the way that they said. And in his letter, in his letter that ends with, I was programmed to kill, that's where um, McGowan gets the title for the book. He said that he, he committed the, the acts because he was promised that the more um, lives he took, uh, he would rule over them um, as they would be his S-L-A-V-E-S in hell. Now, I know that's dark, um, but that is essentially what Murray is saying to Jack about the act of killing, especially killing this, um, this Mr. Gray guy, right? In other words... You're not living, you've been, uh, Jack's been diagnosed with, I don't know, something. Um, and when he gets his diagnosis, he says like, what do the words mean that you're saying to me? And the doctor says, I'm not giving you words, I'm giving you years. You have X number of years to live. Um, which again is like so uh, sinister and in this purely postmodern spirit of enumeration, right? or the internet of things. Everything has to be quantified, you know, uh, quantification of everything down to life and biology and, you know, and your, and your cell structure. In fact, Heinrich, the son, even brings that up at one point. He says, what is life? What, is, what does it mean to live? What's a human body? Is it just, you know, it's molecules, it's, it's cells. And in fact, my murderer chest partner buddy um, that could excuse his act because it wasn't him taking the life of someone else. It was a, it was a brief flash in the brain. It was a chemical reaction, right? He takes all sense of ownership and responsibility, um, uh, and, 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 you know, any kind of virtue or Christian sense of like, what is, what is life out of it? And it's now just pond scum, evolutionary, uh, murder, death, kill, um, tyranny. And what's interesting is that Gladney goes along with this and it, he goes along with it in this weird, you know, like sort of pseudo academic way of like they're doing a case study, right? In fact, uh, you know, base mom and Jamie were talking about that earlier. Um, but in the context and in relation to the uh, experiments, the cults, and the creeper stuff, that there are these charities that do that, you know, that run these sick programs in the, like, in the guise or in the spirit of uh, scientific observation. And even though Gladney and Murray are not scientists, um, they are empiricists, which is interesting because Jack, Jack's whole, his whole being throughout the book is focused on the meaning of something metaphysical. He doesn't just think of death as the, like a thing or the end of life. He thinks of it as this like overwhelming, overarching force that's symbolized by the, the toxic airborne event, the black cloud and how some, you know, somehow he can come to terms with it. Um, and I always think, in, in books when they like focus on, when, you know, when they have meditations on death like that, I always think, okay, how many of these can we get? You know, how many times can we hear characters talk about like, what is death? What's the meaning of death, right? Death be not proud and death shall have no dominion. Um, but, you know, I guess that's what literature and art do in a sense, um, you know, discuss death. But for me, uh, art is, death is a, is, you know, a factor or a component, but it has nothing to do with the meaning of life or the meaning of art. Um, because, you know, again, I think all art, all art is focused on, it runs on two currents and, a, and the two currents, whether it's visual art or literary or music, all art focuses on two things at their core. One is, um, is 
why are we here? What are we doing, right? Um, our relationship with God. And, um, and what's our relationship with each other? What are we supposed to do? What are we supposed to accomplish while we have this time, while we're here? I think, and especially when, um, when art of any media specifically focuses on not those things, when it avoids those things, by doing that, it's still focusing on those things. I was watching the beginning of the um, David Cronenberg adaptation of the book Cosmopolis, which is, again, a Don DeLeo book. Um, and I, honestly, I hate to say this, but I really could not get through the film. Um, I think it doesn't, the book doesn't translate well into film. It's got, it's got, uh, what's his name? Um, the new Batman, um, emo, uh, emo Edward Cullen, Twilight guy. What's his name? Oh, Bob Pattinson. Oh, Bobby, uh, Bob Pattinson plays a like weird billionaire. Um, and in the book, basically what happens is there's a, there's like a, there's a billion, a New York billionaire in a limo trying to get through the city um, through like a like kind of a existential uh, allegorical you know Pilgrim's Progress in a way, and he runs straight into a funeral which is like taking over the city. And the funeral was a real funeral. The funeral is the infamous uh, funeral of Biggie Smalls, right? Notorious B.I.G. Um, N O T O R I. Uh, N O T O R I O. U.S., you just lay down slow, right? Um, Biggie Smalls. Um, I was about to rap Biggie Smalls, but I'm not sure what I can uh, because of some of the some of the spicy language. Um, but recognize a, recognize a real dawn when you see Juan sipping on booze in the House of Blues. I like Biggie Smalls. Anyway, in the book, they run into the uh, funeral of Biggie Smalls, which if you don't know was like a huge event in New York. Um, it was like, it, it got, they, they had a funeral through um, Queens, right? Um, or sorry, through Brooklyn. Uh, bro I'm from Brooklyn. Uh, through, through Brooklyn, and um, so many people came into the street, and it, it had, there was so much traffic, and then it got out of hand, and then there was violence, and it was like this weird, like, cultural, sort of impromptu cultural event in, what was that, 97? Y'all remember Biggie and Tupac? Shit. Were you alive then? Did you care? Did you care about the East Coast, West Coast beef? What'd y'all think of that? You know what's crazy, just as a side note, about the East Coast, West Coast beef? Uh, is that they're both uh, unsolved. Isn't that, isn't that weird? I mean, obviously, it's not weird. It's it's par for the course, and it's total you know bullshit, and everything that goes along with it. But it is weird just on a surface, like, you know, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a boomer and I believe in law and order and the Constitution. It's, it's, it's weird on that level, right? And that counts, that they're both unsolved. Um, there was a movie that came out recently starring John Depp as the detective who investigated. Um, and even the movie was pushed back from release and then was sort of buried. I, I saw it. Um, but it, it is pretty good. Basically, the movie shows that, you know, there was LAPD police collusion, um, that he was, they were, you know, Biggie was assassinated and all this stuff. And, you know, I mean, who who doesn't think that uh, Suge was allegedly um, involved, right? Um, and, uh, but yeah. And, of course, everybody knows that, you know, uh, Tupac's mom was um, a famous Black Panther. I thought everybody knew back when it happened. Remember when um, Tupac was shot at the recording stu studio in New York? I thought everybody back then knew that uh, it was Mob Deep that did that. Remember he was shot like six times and survived? He says it didn't hit him up. He mentions it and hit him up. And then, of course, they came out with that stupid, notorious movie, um, about Biggie, which I thought was so lame. It was obviously, you know, it was produced by his mother. Um, so I'll give her that. But um, yeah, yeah, the vanilla, yes, oh, exactly, Jeff. Yeah, everybody knows the story about Suge and the dog pound, right, and Death Row um, holding uh, Mr. Irving Van Winkle 
That's what I've always thought his name was. Uh, holding Irving Van Winkle over the balcony, making him sign the contract, all that shit. And you know what? I'm sure it's all true. Because as I've mentioned before, Suge Knight was in the same managerial class as Peter Grant from Led Zeppelin. Um, just this hulking, uh, you know, menace of a guy. Except the difference is that, you know, Suge... I mean, remember, have you heard the, the Pac song where, um, what is it? Is it To Live and Die in L.A.? Where at the beginning there's the little recording and you can hear him say, he says, he says, Suge shot me. Suge shot me. Remember that? So, I don't know, you guys. Um, I also saw a an interview from just a couple of years ago where uh, Snoop D-O-double-G was talking about how scared he was of Suge and... Um, they came by and they were like, we're going on a trip. And he was like, I don't want to go on a trip. And they basically, they made him get on the plane and he got on the private plane and he knew that it was just going to be him and certain people, um, from death row. And I think Suge, and he was so sure that they were going to K I L L him that all, and they wouldn't let him take his piece of course on the plane. And all he had was like the, you know, a knife from the, you know, dinner service or whatever. And he said he clutched that the whole time. He was sure he was going to get whacked. So that's, yeah, that, that old thing is crazy, y'all. It's crazy because it's all, you know, PR and a stunt, and then it's real, and then people... that That's what the movie Network's about, remember? Which Jeff has been uh, boosting for a long time. Net, that's what they do in Network at the end. Right? They, they make the PR event and the simulation go live. Um, and that is what happens in this book, except for um, it, they don't really go... It's not that the live event turns into a simulation or vice versa. It's more that the whole thing is sort of a seamless, weird hyper-reality uh, of symbol and simulacra where you don't know... It's not that you don't know dreams from reality, but it's that you don't know whether the reality in which they live has been sort of stage managed for them. Because um, one of the articles I read talks about how the kids are the biggest victims in this little society um, because... Let me find this passage. It says... says oh wait hold on it's in this book hold on give me a second I gotta find this passage um oh yeah okay here we go this is um this is on page. 103 of this book of Harold Bloom's uh, critical analysis of um, Don DeLeo, and this is actually written by uh, Michael Mesmer, who is an associate professor of history at VCU. Shouts out to Virginia Commonwealth University, which is uh, near me in my hood. Um, so it says, what I think, both, this is a criticism of Jean Baudrillard and um, Umberto Eco, right? J.D.'s talking about um, Umberto Eco. And did, what did Eco write? The name of the rose? Uh, what I think Baudrillard and Eco's work reveals is a complex blurring of the real and the fake, of the real and the simulation in all aspects of postmodern life. In the culture of the simulacrum, in nuclear culture, in the America of furious hyperreality. A brilliant evocation of that blurring occurs in Don DeLeo's recent novel, uh, White Noise, and a brief scrutiny of it can help to bring the discussion thus far into concrete focus. DeLeo is one of the most acute and penetrating observers of a American hyper-reality, not least because of the mordant humor he brings to his dissections of the fads and foibles of the society, of the spectacle in which we find ourselves embedded. 
One of the central events in white noise is a major spillage of a highly toxic chemical, which then forms an immense drifting black cloud of lethality, the airborne toxic event, and forces the evacuation of a small college town, including the history professor, who is the book's main character and his family. They become the subjects of a disaster, one which uncannily anticipated the Bhopal disaster in India, thus reversing the position they and we normally assume of being observers of disaster. One of the family's rituals is to watch television together every Friday night. Um, and then the quote is from the book and talks about how they, let's see, close to tears by a sitcom husband arguing with his wife, appear totally absorbed in, this doc in these documentary clips of calamity and death. This is from White Noise. Babette tried to switch to a comedy about a group of uh, kids who build their own com communication satellite. She was startled by the force of our objection. We were otherwise silent, watching houses slide into the ocean, whole villages crackle and ignite in a mass of advancing lava. Every disaster made us wish for more, for something bigger, grander, more sweeping. Okay, back to the criticism. It says, for DeLeo's imagined scenario, substitute another. Suppose that nuclear weapons were used in one of the current wars raging across the globe, perhaps in the Iran-Iraq war, and that the explosions were filmed for television news, as no doubt they would be. Does not DeLeo's text capture one aspect of what the millions and millions of evening news watchers would feel? Does it not capture a sense of what the tens of millions of viewers of actual nuclear explosions have felt? All right, so my criticism of this is that I think this is a, sort of a moot point, and I think it's a... I think it's kind of a, a, a basic criticism um, or a basic like interpretation or substitution of what DeLeo is talking about. Um, obviously, this is written years ago, so we have the benefit of living now through the thing that we do, the great R-E-S-E-T. Um, this book was published in, this book was published in 2003, this criticism, and it's very 2003 because Bloom and some of these other critics discuss DeLeo and White Noise in the context of the war on terror, especially the initial invasion, right? Um, and w what I think is kind of, kind of lame, especially now, is that when he says, suppose that nuclear weapons were used in one of the cur current wars, well, this isn't about nuclear weapons. That's the whole point of the book, that it's not a nuclear weapon. The, the book, White Noise, is not about, like, the nuclear era or the nuclear age, it does have a nuclear family, but that's about the extent of the nuke aspect of it, Is that if that makes sense. It's really a post-nuke world. Even though it, it was published in 85, um, it, it could certainly be set now. I mean, because the book really, I mean, I never gave a proper thesis statement for this book, but what I would say is essentially that um, white noise is a um, is a complete um, satire on the post nuclear uh, pre war on terror uh, electronic era that in a way I guess um, not presupposes but le leads wholeheartedly into the current era of the Great Reset because the, the simulations that occur in the book, especially dealing with chemical and bacteriological warfare um, mixed with sort of direct energy weapon uh, ionization, big pharma, intelligence, academia, is, is the complete melding coagulation synthesis of the elite uh, power structure state. It, it's all in the book. And it's amazing now because we've seen what happens in the book happen in real life just now. In the, it's still happening now. And one major uh, symptom of that, or one major aspect, or one major goal is the individual... It's the fact that the the actions affect individuals it's not they don't it doesn't affect cities or policy or it's you know the state as a whole or 
you know, money or the tax system or any of this stuff, it affects individuals down to the small child in the Gladney family who feels what happens like on a visceral level, but is unable because of his age and he's precocious and, um, and because he's like the, the pure spirit within the book. Um, it, it affects him in that he, he lives, he lives it. He lives all of this. Some people are affected in a way that it changes them uh, conscientiously. I mean, Babette, his wife, becomes addicted to Dylar. Um, Jack uh, attempts to attempts a murder. Um, he uh, has an affair. Uh, Siskind is like basically just you know he's a degenerate anyway. Um, and one character there is actually in the book one character who is pretty based. Um, and I couldn't find really any fault with him. And that was, that is um, Jack's father-in-law. So what happens essentially is uh, Jack wakes up like early in the morning and he looks outside and he sees like this white haired figure sitting in the garden. And like his children are like fascinated. They're like, what is that? Cause they can't tell if this is a, uh, you know, because of the, the toxic chemicals and the spill, they can't tell if it's a ghost or somebody sick with, They've been ionized or somebody's been... They don't know who this is. Um, is it a refugee from another town that was hit with the, the uh, niodine? But it turns out to be um, Jack's father-in-law who just has this shock of white hair. And what happens is he walks up to the house and he says, you know, he basically goes on in. And he's got like... He's an older man, right? He's probably... In, I would say he's like in his early 60s, I guess. He reminds me... The way I think of him is of, um, what's the guy's name, Norm's friend, Billy Joe Shaver. Is that the, the, the outlaw country guy? He's got, like, denim on, and, um, and he's like, yeah, I drove 14 hours to get here. I just came all night. Um, sorry. Get my lighter. And he drove, yeah, he drove 14 hours to come all night, and he says, basically, um, you know, He's like, what are you doing here? And he's like, look, look, uh, I got nothing else going on. He's like, he's like a hard working, hard living. Um, he's not, he's not a, you know, he's not like working class. He's just a, he's just a, he's just a dude. He's an alpha. He, and he obviously alphas over Jack, like completely. Jack is pure, purely cere cerebral, right? He's all, you know, philosophy and history and in his head and at one point, Jack even says, like, you know, that his father-in-law talks about things like, um, he talks about, like, what is he, what word does he use? It's not wrenches, but it's like, uh, I don't know, fi fixing the faucet or something. And he's like, I can't even imagine what it would take to fix a faucet. I know that I should be able to fix a faucet, and a man can do that, but, he, but I have no skills. And his father-in-law finally is like, look, you know, and he gives him a gun. He gives him the, the Zoom waltz. And he says, why do I need this gun? And he says, or he says, why do I give you the, why are you giving me this thing? And he says, don't call it a thing. Um, respect it, right? Call it a, uh, call it a weapon, call it a firearm. Um, keep it on you at all times. And that's unfortunate because he goes on to use it to try to, you know, commit this murder. Um, but uh, his father-in-law's, his, his intentions are pure because what Jack doesn't realize is that, like, this is the, if not the end of the world, right? Uh, DeLeo even says um, in the interview, and of course, again, we can't trust what the author says about their own work necessarily. But he says, I don't write apocalyptic works. I just write works that I think are the end result of what I see in the culture and the zeitgeist. Um, but he, you know, Jack's father-in-law is like, shit is going down, this is happening now, and you need this for your family. And he doesn't really say that, but his actions sort of give, uh, they sort of indicate that. Man, I'm talking with my hands a lot, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, uh, but anyway, he, um, he also says this brilliant thing, what does he say? He says, he asks him what he's doing for a living, and he says, um, he says, I'm moonlight, Except there's there's nothing I'm moonlighting from. Moonlighting is all that's out there, which is like, 
a really simple, um, you know, two sentence uh, statement that sums up his father in law in a way that is incredibly adept and in tune with what's really happening in the world of the novel. Um, at one point, Jack famously, it's, kind of, it's a famous quote from the book, uh, Jack says, you know, when, when the world ends and when society breaks down, um, find a, he says, find a right-wing fringe group to uh, tag onto because right-wing fringe groups are used to uh, practicing how to survive. And that's funny in the book because Jack is like so, he is like the, but I don't even know if he's like, you would classify him as liberal. He's just sort of, um, he's just sort of like a, an oblivious, not even nihilistic. He's like just oblivious. He's not aloof. He just has no, he has a concept of the fact that there is meaning in the world, but he can't find any. Does that make sense? Um, and let's see, he says, oh, we did the kill to live thing, page 291. Um, let's see, page 281, I want to read you this passage. It's, this book is so beautiful. I can't even begin to quote from the book, and it's hard to go through specific passages because, like, I'm not going to do it justice, um, even though, I mean, look, you know, I annotated the shit out of this book because it, but it, it's so hard because every word is, is, it's amazing because it's written with this sense of like words as data, but that's a commentary and that's ironic because it, it's actually incredibly poetic. He says, um, let's see, page 281 says, it's like Zen, Grandpa. Um, says the old gentleman runs a hand through the thatch of white hair the woman holds her folded specks against her face clouds race against the westering moon the seasons change in somber montage going deeper into winter stillness a landscape of silence and ice your doctor knows the symbols so that the end of what that means is that uh, the doctors in this book are of a certain, they, they are the new priest class, which, which is, I mean, I don't even need to comment on that. That's, we, we've seen this so much in the commentary and the, and the analysis of, especially with Jay, right? Um, Globalist book series over and over with Tristan has pointed this out. Um, and that's exactly what happens in the book. Um, the power principle Oh, this is pages 257, 258. Um, it says, it made me think of the law of ruins. Um, I told Murray that Albert Speer, you guys know who Albert Speer is, right? Um, the personally chosen architect of Hotler, who was designing uh, Germania, the new um, N-O-T-S-E-E -E capital, um, and was in, you know, the so-called inner circle and all that. Um, what's the name of Spears' book? Um, uh, I forget the name. Anyway, remember he went to prison and then was released. It says, I told Murray that Albert Speer wanted to build structures that would decay gloriously, impressively, like Roman ruins. No rusty hulks or gnarled steel slums. He knew that Hotler would be in favor of anything that might astonish posterity. He did a drawing of a Reich structure that was to be built of special materials, allowing it to crumble romantically. A drawing of fallen walls, half columns, fueled in wisteria. The rain is built into the creation, I said, which shows a certain nostalgia behind the power principle or a tendency to organize the longings of future generations. Murray said, I don't trust anybody's nostalgia but my own. Nostalgia is a product of dissatisfaction and rage. It's a settling of grievances between the present and the past. The more powerful the nostalgia, the closer you come to violence. War is the form nostalgia takes when men are hard-pressed to say something good about their country. Damn, dude, this is so... The, do you see how powerful the language is? And it's so true, right? And it's just a... It takes the form... Really, the book is, is a strange sort of Socratic dialogue um, between these two men, like sort of... Uh, 
you know, ruminating on the ruins of uh, the academy. But what he's saying here is that essentially the this is sort of a take on the, you know, for instance, the American um, the American uh, construction of the the cap, you know, the sort of what am I trying to say? The the Pax Romana, Pax uh, Britannica, Pax Americana, Washington D.C. grid system, uh, Roman neoclassical uh, temple architecture, which is built uh, obviously built um, not with ruins in mind, but one can foresee that if they were to fall to ruin, you know, with the Ozymandias sort of sands of time, that they would produce a beautiful ruin. They would leave something which would indicate the, the power and the majesty of this you know, lost civilization. All the great civilizations have done that. We, we discussed this in detail when we talked about um, Lord Byron, remember, and Byronic heroes and the idea of British romanticism and how the, really the symbol of uh, the British romantic movement and all of the literature is the... Is the uh, the sort of abbey in ruins, right? Tintern Abbey, um, uh, Byron's uh, Newstead Abbey. All these places are like, they're, be they're beautiful and they're majestic, but they're in ruins. But the ruins themselves are also beautiful um, and have a sort of order to them. And that is the exact uh, antithesis of the state of the Niodine D. Dylar, um, Milex, White Noise, Panasonic, um, Electrolysis, and Radiation Death of the postmodern world, especially America, that is uh, conveyed through DeLeo's prose in this book. Okay, I'm going to start to wrap it up now because it is, wow, it's getting real late night, y'all. We're getting into them. Uh, Basement breathalyzing analysis hours. Um, wasn't that cool though? What he talked, when he what he said about nostalgia. Um, a couple of other things just about the book. I would say that it is. Um, it really also is in line with. Remember Harold Bloom's statement about uh, the American religion, right? This sort of blend of Gnosticism and Pentecostalism. Um, of course, th this book is not really. I mean, I'm, I suppose you could analyze the book for Gnostic elements, um, but it sort of shies away from that. Um, and it does have some of the sort of, I mean, it, it actually speci specifically mentions Pentecostalism in some parts. Um, uh, we didn't really get into the significance or the symbolism of both um, uh, Hortler and Elvis in the book. I think that I think the obvious thing, just to sum it up quickly, um, why he's a professor of uh, Hotler studies is because in the normal run-of-the-mill um, citizenry, there is nothing that attracts more fear and dread than H-I-T-L-E-R, right? I mean, that's, e that's even a meme. And so um, when the new thing happens and it's there and they can see it and it's this black toxic cloud of death chemicals and cancer and uh and you know chem warfare uh they're they there's they're stunned and they don't really know what to do with it um even the dumbass people who are like literally dumb uh, in the book just even they think about this like on a sort of quasi-intellectual level. They see this thing, and then they're like, mm, I don't know what that is. Which is interesting, because is that a form of unreliable narration in that, is it real? Are we actually seeing this? Is it a projection? Uh, is it a projection just like the static fuzz on the television screen that entrances the family? Um, and is there sort of, you know, that's, that's their kind of ritual. They gather around this sort of holy object. It's where they get all their meaning. Um, obviously, now in 2022, the the television itself has been, you know, when people bring up the TV, you don't watch the TV. It's going to rot your brain. I mean, that's that's past, right? Um, now we have these, we have these uh, these um, you know 
monoliths, these 2001 um, uh, sort of, you know, these, these black mirrors that we carry around on us 24-7. So the, the TV is sort of obsolete in that sense. But it's the same. The symbol still holds, right? Um, okay, so um, let's see. Just one more thing. Um, the enormous dark mass moved like some death ship in a Norse legend, escorted across the night by armored creatures with spiral wings. We weren't sure how to react. It was a terrible thing to see. So close, so low, packed with chlorides, benzenes, phenols, hydrocarbons, or whatever the precise toxic content. It's page 127. Our fear was accompanied by a sense of awe that bordered on the religious. This was a death made in the laboratory, defined and measurable. There you go, right? A Fort Detrick designed, lab tested, uh, psyoped, chem war, simuvac, um, uh, false flag, crisis actor operation. Uh, Jess says, I'm sorry, BLA, I'm afraid I can't do that. Uh, you can By the time we get to Phoenix, he'll be outside the door. Ferocious, aren't I? When I think of a woman's... Afraid to say it on here. Something just comes out of me. Because she got a great ass. You got your head all the way up it. What you want for that? A junior G-man badge? Man, I get killed for telling you this shit. You get killed walking your doggy. Slick, slick. What's that? What's that? What's slick? Michael Chirito. Chirito. Michael Chirito. Got a big ass peacock right here. What else? Um, he says, uh, What's wrong with you? You get me out here. We remember the guy, we, we thought we had him. Heat is interesting because, like, the two sides are mirrors of each other. They're exactly like one side has West Duty, the other side has, um, what's his name? Uh, what's the machete guy? Get his name. One side has Ted Levine, right? Oh, we, we thought we had him. The other side has, there's somebody that's exactly like him on the other side. Who is it? Uh, uh, Pacino's side has, like, the blonde dude, remember? And Pacino, Pacino's like, how you feeling? You okay? All right, good. And then the other side has Val. Dude, Tom Seesmore rules in that movie. I'm going to call him Tom Seesmore. I don't know. Whatever you want to do. Not on this one. Not on this one. Um, Wayne Grow. Tell him, tell him, tell him Wayne Grow's here. I am a cowboy looking for anything heavy. Man, Wayne Grow's a scary dude, right? I read that Wayne Grow, um, has Wayne Grove been in any other shit? He's been in like one or two other movies. I think he, I think that's him in real life. Man, why didn't they just fucking why didn't they do it in that in the after the restaurant scene? Man, come on, dude. Right? He had the trunk all ready. Yo, what's the guy's name? What's the machete guy's name? Um and he drives the El Camino. Be kind to me. Be kind to me. Remember he says that? There's a flip side to that coin. What if you do got me boxed in? Because I will not hesitate. Not for a second. Yeah, we've been sitting here like a couple of regular guys. Yes, thank you, Danny Trejo. What are you, a monk? I got a woman. <laughs> um... Henry, uh, man, what the fuck? What's wrong with me, dude? I'm a liar. What's his name? Henry, Henry Rollins. Dude, Henry Rollins, man. I love that movie. Cigarette is going out. 
I keep babbling so much that my cigarette goes out. Henry that I like that movie because it makes Henry Rollins look like a total beta. Um, and he just takes his head and throws him through that window. And it's got uh, whatever that dude's name is, the character actor um, that he calls on the phone. Because there was a dead man on the other end of this fucking line. What's that guy's name? That guy's name looks like it would be Lance in real life. He's really cool. He's in like a million movies. Um, he was in, remember he was like, you don't know who you're fucking with. And he had the shotgun in Dark Knight. Um, he was in, he was in The Perfect Storm. That guy's been in like everything. What is that guy's name? I don't even want to know his name because I'm. He, he looks like his name is Lance. Like Lance Williamson or something. And I'm not confusing him with Lance Henriksen, who I just saw in the movie Powder. Have you guys seen the movie Powder? We got to do. We got to analyze the movie Powder, man. But the thing is, like, it is. I remember when it came out and I was like, whoa, it's a guy who has supernatural powers. That's cool. And man, I saw I saw like some of it tonight that I could watch. It is total, total confirm, total monarch, um, everything. Uh, Jeff Goldcomb is in it. He plays like basically Yuri Geller. Um, it's got um, what's the guy's name? I think Sean Patrick Flannery plays. The powder gun. It's got some weird, like, sort of fake and gray scenes in it. Um, uh, it's, man, it's, it's, it's a dark movie, dude. There were a lot of those kind of, like, uh, dark movies like that that came out in the 90s. That movie, uh, there's a movie called, like, never mind. I don't even want to talk about those movies. It's weird as shit. Um, but I guess my favorite of those kind of movies um, was this Disney movie that came out when I was like five or something, it's called The Boy Who Could Fly. I thought that was awesome. Um, now, looking back, I know that like he was probably T-O-R-T-U-R-E-D and he was um, he was a Spurg. But when I saw the movie, I thought it was cool because he could fly. He could, he could fucking fly. That's amazing. All I wanted to do when I was little was fly. That in the movie Daryl, Data Analyzing Robot Youth Life Form, and um, Flight of the Navigator, which all, by the way, are like pretty, pretty dark. Oh, William Fitchner. Yep. Thank you, Jeff. You are the king. And of course, that that name does fit him, by the way, William Fitchner. Uh, uh, Bearer Bonds, right? Uh, it's uh, exotic, can't be traced. Tom sees me. I always called him Tom Seasmore because I had a friend who, in eighth grade, called him Tom Seasmore. Um, how awesome was he as the Sarge? Dude, he's like the quintessential Sarge in Saving Private Ryan, right? He fucking gets shot all those times and he's still, like, hobbling over there with that rocket launcher. That's cool as hell. Mad Damon. We gotta go in there and save Mad Damon. Because everybody in Matt Damon's family's dead, so we got to kill everybody. Uh, and then the old man who plays like George C. Marshall, what Lincoln called the better angels of our nature. That's a great part for that dude, even though he talks about L I N C O L M. I hate that. But I do like the better angels of our nature. That's cool. Um, and then, oh, that movie's weird. Same Private Ryan is weird because it's got the brothers McMullen or whatever, that, that dude who, by the way, is, like, also Matt Damon. He's the same guy. Um, I forget that um, Vin Diesel is in that movie as, like, you know, private dumbass. Um, it's got that other dude, Adam Goldberg or whatever, who has, like, the worst death in all of cinema. That death is, like, fucking horrible, dude. I felt that shit. That was awful. Um, and it's got the cool sniper dude who, like, is... a He's like beta. He's like Walmart John Depp. That guy, um, that guy's cool. I like him because like he has a clear conscience. He can sleep at night. That's pretty awesome. But that movie's weird. That like who did the analysis of that? That was good. Uh, Rob Ager. Rob Ager did an interesting analysis of that because you know again it's like oh this anti-war movie, but it's not. It's a pro-war propaganda movie. 
um, that that dehumanizes one side completely. And th- I get it, but like, don't like advertise it as the opposite. That's weird. Also, that last scene where they do the like Michael Jackson f- like uh, uh, face swap, uh, face morph from young Matt Damon into like old not Matt Damon. It's a different actor. That was weird. That was weird, right? And the camera's like right up in his damn face, and he's like crying. He has to cry. That's 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 odd. Also, I thought that his um like his two daughters or whatever were hot when I saw it. And it's got, of course, it's got that like ubiquitous, um, uh, like sort of translucent American flag like waving in the sunshine. They do that in all the Michael Bay movies. Ager impression. Well, Ager's got um. Ager is from, where's he from? He's from the North. He's from Northern England. He's from Northern England. Um, I, can't really do, I can't really do a Northern English impre- um, accent. It's pretty difficult. Northern, I'll have to listen to something he says and like copy a sentence. Um, it, it, man, his channel's pretty, I like his channel. Um, shouts out to Jeff who tweeted at him one time to do the Ewoks. And he responded and then did started doing Star Wars analysis. He was listening to our homeboy. Um, he also does uh, an excellent Exorcist and uh, series of Shining um, uh, analyses. JD um, uh, referenced him. I think he uh, cited him in his, I think he cited him in his footnotes. Of course, some Spurg will go and um, look up the footnote. Shouts out to JD, who does, obviously, the best um, Hollywood analyses of all time and has covered, I guess, everything. Um, all of the great films. I got JD's ESO Hollywood right up there. Um, all right, y'all. I guess that's about it. We've been babbling on here for a while. Thanks for chilling with me. I'm glad we did this late night stream. Of course, if anybody's watching this, you know, in the morning or something like that, they're going to go, what, what are these people talking about? But you know what? That's cool. That's cool. Come hang with us. My next analysis will be, um, I think I'm, the next one will be maybe the sponsored Twain stream that Jack sponsored um, with the Prince. I'm going to do the Prince and the Pauper. If you guys remember that story. Prince and the Pauper, which is a good switcheroo, Freaky Friday, doppelganger um, story. And I also got another book of Twain short stories. I'll talk about Val Kilmer's one-man show, Mark Twain. That's going to be an interesting one because, you know, I've read Twain and everything, but I I wouldn't say that I'm, like, a fan of Mark Twain. So it'll be interesting to uh, dive. I do, of course, know Mark Twain's work and um, can talk about the significance of it, especially in terms of American literature. Uh, I'm uh, probably going to avoid um, certain works uh, just for the channel and the algorithm, of course. Um, and then also we've got, uh, what else do we have? We've got some music analysis coming up. We've got a little bit of uh, Thin Lizzy that um, somebody has requested. We've got um, some early 2000s uh, like rock and pop lyrics. Um, we might uh, tack on to BHM and Jamie and do some Britney Spears lyrics. I want to talk about Eric Clapton's Biography and the Crossroads facility. Um, we might do some other book, uh, music books. Um, here's, again, Don DeLeo's White Noise. We covered this article that was in, let's see, New York Times about Don DeLeo. We covered that one today. We covered this 1985 article about... Um, Don DeLeo, and my only other DeLeo book that I have here is Point Omega. And, of course, we covered this uh, Harold Bloom analysis. And I've got, I really need to get a copy of The Confidence Man by Melville because um, J.D. was um, analyzing that a little while ago, and maybe that would be uh, worth bringing up or worth a discussion. Shouts out to all our homies out there, um, especially to all the subs for Jerry Exposing Powerful Lies live streams. Keep, keep on going, Iceman. We love you, and you have the most amazing uh, person, personality, character, wisdom, and channel. And We love you, homeboy. Shouts out to all of our friends out there, um, especially Mixkey also. 
uh, please go to Mixkey's Instagram at Tech Noir Graphics and follow him because he makes amazing uh, memes, videos, animation. Uh, shouts out to Jetski, Blocksky, Nateski. Okay, all our friends out there. Kristen, Slowboy Whiteboard, of course, Jay's Analysis, Primal Edge Health, uh, Church of the Eternal Logos, The Green Feathers. Shouts out to Ellie, A Devotional Heart, uh, Rachel Based Homeschool Mom. Shouts out to Shouts out to Andy at the Crucible, by the way. Um, if you guys didn't see it, Andy was so sweet and so cool. Um, he had Alex Stein on his show. They did an interview, and um, he was sweet enough to ask uh, Alex Stein to do a shout-out for your boy right here, and he did the most amazing shout -out. Should I show you this before we leave? Um, if you haven't seen this, um, check out Alex Stein's uh, shout out that he did for me because Andy at the Crucible asked him to, and that was that meant a lot to me. So let's see if you can hear this. Um, uh, just get ready for some spicy language, and then we're gonna go. Okay. Wouldn't mind for just a second. Poor Dangerfield was recently in a car accident. You wouldn't mind shouting him out. Uh, that would be based lit analyzer. If you wouldn't mind doing that on the channel, I'd appreciate that. Dangerfield Henley, my man. I just, you gotta get better. Get that cheddar. I know you're gonna make them chicks way wetter once you heal. I know you're gonna have that pussy on deck. You're gonna write the chat. You're gonna come correct, baby. So just stay on the ground like Primetime 99, and you're gonna come back stronger, bigger, faster, stronger, as, as Daft Punk once said. And that was the best shout out I've ever heard in the existence of the Crucible, Alex Stein. 99. There we go. Very sweet, very sweet shout out, you guys. Um, so that was awesome. Shouts out to our homies out there. All right, y'all. That's about it. I'll leave y'all. I hope you have a wonderful weekend. Um, and thanks for being here with me late night. I'll see y'all later. Peace.